For the United States and its allies to win World War II, necessity became the mother of innovation. As critical needs arose in the drive across the Pacific, the Americans had to be able to quickly assess the situation and quickly produce a solution, often in the field and often with little to no testing. And even then, when it finally came time to use the solution, they often found that its primary use would be more effective in another place. Underwater demolition teams, or UDT, were originally used in Europe and would go on to play a role in the Normandy landings on D-Day. However, it would be in the Pacific, and the amphibious landings taking place across the whole theater where UDT would come into their own. U.S. Navy commanders took a crash course on what faulty intelligence, a lack of understanding of the tides or knowledge of the current conditions on the beachheads could lead to during the disastrous landings at Tarawa in November of 1943. While U.S. Marines riding in the LVTs were able to crawl across the reef blocking the entrance to the lagoon on the island of Bito, the following landing waves were on Higgins boats, which required a minimum of 5 feet of water to pass safely above the reef. Because of inaccurate information regarding the reef, and a neap tide which kept the water even lower than usual, the sea height was not sufficient for the Higgins boats to cross. This forced the Marines to wade to the island exposed to withering Japanese fire the whole way and they took heavy casualties as a result. After the carnage which took place during the Tarawa operation, American amphibious planners realized the critical need for current information on these islands moving forward to avoid needless bloodshed. Here, at this crossroads of the Pacific Campaign where the whole idea of amphibious assaults was still being questioned by some, entered an intrigue but an incredibly driven man named Dropper Kaufman and his new UDT outfits. Kaufman was someone who was used to overcoming adversity and finding his own way. Although he was a 1933 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, he was denied a commission in the regular Navy because his eyesight was so poor. Determined to make a difference, he volunteered as an ambulance driver in France in 1940. He was captured by the Germans and eventually released. After his release from German captivity, he ended up in England with a commission in the Royal Navy Reserve. And during the Blitz in fall and winter of 1940-1941, he found himself in the dangerous work of disarming unexploded German bombs and mines. Recalled to duty in the U.S. Navy right before Pearl Harbor, Kaufman set up bomb dis disposal schools for the U.S. Navy and U.S. Army before taking on his toughest task yet developing the framework and tactics of the UDT. After setting up training at Fort Pierce, Florida in 1943, Kaufman went to work to find the best and brightest the U.S. Navy had to offer and get them to volunteer. Many of the men came from the U.S. Navy's Reserve Officer Program from several U.S. colleges. Other volunteers came from the CVs. The men were assigned to six-man teams and were run through a gauntlet of training courses, including lectures, small craft handling, swimming, explosive training, and anything else these men could use that they could expect to see in combat. Training was demanding, and many men did not complete it. If a man did manage to make it through the course, he was faced with a final 24-hour-a-day, 7-day week of training. The current-day U.S. Navy SEAL's famous Hell Week was born out of this arduous final course. Although a small detachment of UDT had been involved during the Battle of Kajalin in January of 1944, the first large-scale use of UDT would come during the attack on the Marina Islands and the Battle of Saipan in June of 1944. The men would find out the depth of the water inside the reef ringing the island, look for potential landing obstacles, and mark paths for tanks to safely make it ashore without succumbing to deep water. Fishing lines were used to map a grid to be used by the landing forces to get ashore. As if this duty were not hazardous enough, this would be conducted in broad daylight right under the noses of the Japanese defenders. Despite all the difficulties facing the UDT at Sapan, they accomplished their mission magnificently and played major roles on the islands of Tinan and Guam as well in the marinas. The UDT would go on to be an integral to the success of every major U.S. amphibious assault for the remainder of the war. The largents Contingent of UDT would come at Okinawa in March and April 1945. Almost 1,000 UDT members took part in the operations in the frigid waters off the island. By the end of the war, there were 34 total underwater demolition teams with 21 seeing combat. 
Even with the end of the war in August of 1945, UDT operations did not cease. UDT-21 was the first U.S. military unit to deploy to Japan and accept the surrender of a Japanese unit in the home islands. UDT continued to operate through the Korean War and into the 1960s and the Vietnam War. However, by this time, their role had changed, and they had added an unconventional warfare component to their repertoire. Underwater demolition teams, born out of the necessity of World War II, became what we now know today as the U.S. Navy SEALs. Thank you.